Thank you very much. So, as Lasse said yesterday, my colleague from the Free University, now to something completely different, to have the Monty Python effect here. Um, well, thanks for the invitation. I'm very honored to be able to join here today and to participate in this symposium. Um, well, music as cultural diplomacy is a Venezuelan case of El Sistema. Um, what I wanted to say first, I'm ethnomusicologist, so I'm not very specialized in classical music. But what I did is to connect two things of diplomacy here. One, my personal case, which uh, contains uh, field research in Venezuela, as well as some aspects of this system. But I hope we will uh, get a more or less small picture of this was uh, introduced before. So I thought the best thing to introduce to um, Gustavo Dumel is to listen to and maybe see the orchestra. So I put the video first. Sound? Okay, sound. Yeah, sound. Ask me if you can. Fascinating moment. 
notice that the group is looking through these bumps of Quintus Concerina. Better way? All right. Um, for me, is that invisible but fascinating emotion, what is produced here, what we have seen, uh, as a listening experience with goosebumps from the first second of the performance. An energy which could be an important input for our human relations and interaction which we try to understand and to reflect in cultural diplomacy. So where does this interaction, or where does this energy come from? And what do we learn from that kind of presentation, appropriation, and transformation what the young conductor Gustavo Dudamel and his young orchestra transmit. The starting point of the final result of musical ingenuity can be found in the so-called El Sistema, as we heard. It is a more or less open system of musical education, learning teamwork, sharing emotions, and family character, which forms talents by means of motivation and love. Yes, I mean love in the Venezuelan sense to create children and to teach children with the word amor uh, as a basic axiom, which is first than anything else. Well, the facts now. Uh, the system was founded in 1975 by the economist and musician Jose Antonio Abreu uh, under the name of Social Action for Music. For many years, its official name was Fundación del Estado para el Sistema Nacional de las Orquestas Juveniles y Infantiles de Venezuela. Uh, it has recently changed to Fundación Musical Simón Bolívar, including today between three, uh, 310,000 uh, to 370,000 children in 180 centers or music schools all over Venezuela. 90,000 teachers of classical music attending children with mostly poor socioeconomic backgrounds. As um, we heard before, the most famous member, as we have seen in the introduction, is Gustavo Duramel. He was born in Barquisimeto and entered the stage as a conductor with 12 years. Later on, he began to win a number of conducting competitions, including the Gustav Mahler Conducting Prize in Germany in 2004. He was noticed uh, by conductors such as Simon Reddle and uh, Claudio Abado, who accepted invitation to conduct the Simon Bolivar Orchestra in Venezuela. Dudamel debuted with the uh, Philharmonia, the Israel Philharmonics, and the Los Angeles Philharmonics. In 2005, he and uh, the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra recorded the Fifth Symphony of Ludwig van Beethoven, contracted by Deutsche Grammophon. In April 2007, during a guest conducting engagement with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Dudamel was named the LIP's Los Angeles Philharmonics next music director as the 2009-2010 season. His initial contract in Los Angeles was five years, beginning in September 2009. In February 2011, the orchestra announced that it was extending his contract for additional five seasons through the end of uh, 2018 to 2019 season. Well, so much for the bare facts. Uh, it can be summarized that El Sistema stands not only for a wide net of musical education of young people from the quoted poor social background, it also selects and produces talents and helps them to find their artistic accomplishment. Well, but where uh, so much good things to find, there's always the other side of the coin. Besides the positive image of the public relations, there are critics hearable, which needs to be an analyzed by an anthropological point of view, or better to say, point of ear. Honestly, as an auditory anthropologist or ethnomusicologist for a long time, during my stay in Venezuela, I was not very touched uh, by the orchestra and our system. I heard about, I read about, but it never attracted broad interest as my studies are focused on authentic or traditional music, especially Amerindian sound production and ontology. Sometimes the small pieces reach my ear confirming the cliches with sound fragments of Beethoven, Mahler, and Beethoven again, and Stravinsky, and maybe Mahler again, or Beethoven again. What I want to say using this redundancy is that the form of a today's strange perception of music reflects the position of ethnomusicology as another system, as a closed system, and maybe radical system. This radicalization against classical music has its origin as a perception of classical music as a representation of colonialism, as it was composed in the center of the European power, even acculturating indigenous or authentic music played on the periphery. 
The critical voices of Venezuelan culture producers against El Sistema declare Beethoven and Mahler guilty why 90% of the state budget for art and culture, which is $29 million, are flowing down. Venezuelan traditional music is running out of focus, and even the heard mambo from Bernstein West Side Story can be, can be interpreted as an appropriation of Latin music through Western-centered established composers, exploiting sounds to create an imaged Latin American sound, which is Orientalism of Zaid, maybe heard before. The constructed image is even transmitted by the orchestra, abusing themselves, aiming to enter from periphery to the center, Instead of presenting Latin American music and its traditional music as an identity, European composers are played and the tambor, the drums, were left unused in the corner. Well, so far the other side of the coin, the critics from the radical ethnomusicological position. It needs to be mentioned here that indirect critics are published by journalists as Wolfram Goetz in Die Zeit in December 2006, writing that it is better to have an own violin as a stolen handbag. Goetz refers to the poor socioeconomic background of the young musicians, which he tries to, inter which is maybe an idea of an ironic interpretation, but the whole article implicates that all people from Venezuelan barrios are poor people who does not work, and poor people without work are malandros. They are thieves, murderers, rapers, let's say criminals in general. It needs to be noted that crime is something completely different in a Latin American barrio. Religion, as the Maria Leonza called in the barrios, are included the so-called corte malandros. That means there are special interaction of criminals, humans as well as non-humans, maybe killed murderers, who are interacting through music and trance. Crime is more important as a symbol of religion than as an appropriation of goods of economical reason. That maybe helps to approach an idea concerning the still rising homicide rate. But I will not pursue that issue further. Next to the special role of criminality in the barriers, it is needless to say that not every inhabitant is a criminal. People work hard for everyday life and suffer from the criminal threat around the corner. Not all children owning a trumpet today had to be malandros in case they never entered El Sistema, on the other hand. And there's another fact. Dunamel's father was a musician and voice teacher. The symbol of El Sistema was never from a barrio family. But as often in life, the approach to phenomena lies somewhere in between, and maybe not in public relation. I included here the both sides of the quoted coin. Well. Using the center periphery argumentation of Stuart Hall, again, it is important to separate this concept from topographical constructions. Venezuela is not periphery. So here we find the first real critics on stereotypes and cliches as radical ethnomusicologist has constructed. I want to return to the fact that the first recording of Gustav, Gustavo Dudamel and his Boliv, uh, Bolivar Symphonic Orchestra was Symphony No. 5, written by Ludwig van Beethoven. The question, why a Latin American youth orchestra plays and even records Beethoven, implies different kinds of answers. From a European point of view, they decided to record Beethoven to enter into the center of power due to musical conformism, using the music to present the colors of the national nationality with that strange non-conformism represented by the training jackets uh, which Chavez and Maduro wear in public presentations. This is the president, uh, the former was Chavez and now it's Maduro. European European written music serve as a transmitter of public relations for nationalism, oil, and maybe as a vehicle for political ideas. And from the cultural difference and post-colonial point of view, we can quote, quote Wolfram Goetz again when he says, here in Europe, unsafe and dangerous subway stations are supplied with classical music with the purpose of deterrence. Kids do not like the music and stay away from such horror place where classical music is played. In Venezuela, a short classical fragment of Beethoven played by a child and his violin brings a large crowd together in a few seconds. That confirms Dudamel's suggestion when he was asked how to enthuse children for classical music. 
with Beethoven, he's answered, generating in a metaphor of destination as the Fifth Symphony stands for and the cultural background of the young professional musician of the Simon Bolivar Orchestra. His answer leads me to an anthropological question beyond all those points of views. What does we hear and what does we feel? What has happened to, to other uh, senses humans are equipped with but never use while seeing defines our truth? And which role music plays in cultural interaction? To understand the separation of seeing and hearing as the definitions of culture, we need to consider the quite important dichotomy of interiority and physicality. Therefore, I want to show another example of my field research I did in the territory of Piemont people located in southeast uh, Venezuela on the border to Guyana and northern Brazil. Okay, this is also Venezuela. And um, I will bring now a second uh, example of cultural diplomacy and music. And I will connect it finally with um, the case of El Sistema. The region is well known for its touristic highlights as Raima Tepui or Angel Falls. In 1911, Theodor Koch Grünberg, on the left side to see, a German linguist and anthropologist, recorded there around 50 wax cylinders containing Amerindian songs. His recordings were archived in the Ethnological Museum, Berlin, where they still can be found. My initial idea was to bring that recordings back to the Piemont people. First of all, because they did not have this material of their own culture, their cultural heritage, was this the, the name what I saw in this in the program here we talk about cultural heritage, and this Piemont people never had their cultural heritage. And secondly, I was interested what kind of musical continuity and discontinuities can be found. One of the most interesting parts was the wax cylinder number 41. The German anthropologist labeled the recording as a song from mission time. It was called Alleluia, and the influence of Western folk tradition was obviously audible. The German musicologist Erich Moritz von Hornbosse transcribed the wax cylinder number 41 and comments, what we hear is probably an Irish or English song. This recording was and still is, in some publications, a symbol of a Western dominance of Amerindian cultures. So as far as here, we will listen to Amerindian songs now. I presented this recording in 2005 in Venezuela to an Amerindian, Amerindian Piemont specialist. On the right side, this is Babina Lambos. After hearing Wax Cylinder 41, the anonymous opinion was, what we hear is the song, The Sweet By and By, or in Spanish, I Mundo Feliz Más Allá. The composer is J.P. Webster, who wrote this song in 1862. The song is still today gladly sung in Christian context. The important point is that some musical phrases were changed into Amerindian musical system, but the lyrics of Cylinder 41 are unintelligible. That means the English language was imitated by sound and language syntax was not important. Today, the Alleluia is a two-hour trance ritual performed in several Piemont Amerindian communities. The participants sing and dance until their souls, their interiority, leaves the body to enter paradise or heaven's gate. The participants can see the Masaya, or the land which is farther than day, the paradise, and they hear God's voice and the chorus of angel, as well as the trumpet of San Miguel. 
To understand what happened in 1911, we should have a look at the story about the first meeting of the founder of the ritual, Alleluia, and Anglican missionaries, which took place sometimes in the 1880s. Um, P.G. Wern was the name of this uh, American shaman, met some missionaries who tried to teach him Christian morality. But P.G. Wern was bored and asked the missionaries about the way to God. The missionaries understood that he asked for Christian ethics, living a whole life as a Christian to be transformed in the end when the soul, leave, when the soul will leave the body. But an Amerindian shaman is, as you maybe heard about, a spirit walker. You see Lone Ranger, kind of the Lone Ranger in the new Johnny Depp movie. Uh, the way to God means to meet God right here and right now. To do so, one of the main important skills for connect the spirit like God, Jesus, or St. Peter's is singing. Alleluia songs were imitation of mission songs a hundred years ago. Today, Alleluia songs show the structure of the traditional songs and the lyrics are mixed, different Amerindian dialects as well as the appropri appropriated English terms. Anthropologists define that amalgamation of languages, ritual language. What I wanted to show is, in Amerindian Latin, which is now creolization societies, authority and self-identity is defined by appropriation and incorporation of the others. Here we have a very important difference to Western society, where self-identity is defined by enclosing boundaries and delineations. The dichotomy, um, dichotomy can be found in the ontological concepts analyzed by Philippe Descolar. Western society is defined as naturalism, where we differ between the different minds, spirit, similar bodies. Um, the only difference we do is male and female. Amerindian and animistic societies are defined by a similar interiority and a different perception of the body, physicality. Cultural hybrids and transculturation emerge in the process of the so-called creolization. Anyway, besides two, uh, two new forms of musical performances, Devices reveal an ontological continuity which creates cultural difference and identity. The interpretation, and I'll come back to Dudamel, the interpretation of Western composers by Dudamel's youth orchestra is an appropriation and incorporation. To play Beethoven or Bernstein's means for the orchestra to play it as it was for the last time. Intensive and full of rhythm, because what we hear and feel is the interaction with a non-human. Maybe the agent of Beethoven, Mahler, or Bernstein. The interaction with those musical uh, entities in concert hall represents a kind of transpecific trans communication in classical music as hybrid animist naturalist ontology. Like most Western people are not able to hear or to feel it, they have to see the appropriation and incorporation. The training jackets is not only public relation in Venezuelan cars, um, they are a self-identity through appropriation of Bernstein. So for all people who are not able to hear or to feel the difference, this ironic clause is used, and it's necessary as most Western people prefer classical music as a self-performance and social sign, showing and defining the affront to non-classical milieus, to use Per Bourdieu here. The connection of sound, interiority, and physicality in a concert hall opens another general critics, as I asked in the beginning, what we can learn of El Sistema. The first and most important point, which is to mention here, is the financial support uh, by the Banesco Bank of a multitude of young people in education to choose talents. A system differing from Western system of rejection and network due to analogical projection of similarities in CVs. The second point is Plato when he defines seeing as the main sense of the truth, oppressing all other senses to approach to the phenomena of the life world, German Lebensfeld. It is his separation of the mind-spirit, or Geist, and the heart which complicates Western interaction and diplomacy. Finally, I want to let speak Dudamel again, showing his teaching practice to demonstrate what I try to explain here all the time. And I have more energy for, and I go again to all the orchestra. I, I, I learn a lot when I'm working with, with the kids.
con la música, es igual, si yo hago mi, re, do, re, mi, sol, la, so, no digo nada, si yo hago mi, re, do, re, mi, sol, la, so, So I hope you can feel it now. <laughs> also, the separation of written language and sound production has led us to forget the real importance of human and even non-human interaction, which includes techniques in a Latour sense. And we have never been modern. It is not important to us why do Mel records Beethoven. It is important to us how he does it. The short sequence shows the importance of the reconnection of heart and mind in the recent times. I wonder, for instance, how an iPad of the new Steve Jobs schools will solve that problem, hopefully with the content of the sound of the Venezuelan case of El Sistema. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, maybe I forgot. Um, I took the points in the beginning. The idea was that uh, the musician and, and um, economist Abreu um, did a, a deal with uh, Banesco Bank, which is one of the yeah, uh, leading banks in Venezuela, for support um, kids from the barrio. Barrio is favela, everyone knows it's the poor socioeconomic we background. Have yeah, I believe we, I think we have a barrio in Berlin as well. So um, um, when you go down to New Cole. Uh, what I want to uh, say, uh, what is important to say that um, uh, kids had the possibility to um, enter music schools. They um, were gifted by a violin or by a trumpet, what I want to play. And uh, they were members of this orchestra. And um, as I mentioned before, the important point is, is not only the music, it's the family character. And what I want to tell was, was love, is teaching with love and bringing kids together and, um, and use them for, for classical music. And um, even what I forget as well, now it's coming up uh, what I call the transformation of music from Beethoven to uh, Hector Villalobos into the Brazilian composers are more important now. But uh, the idea is, and this is all over Venezuela, I have a lot of friends uh, who are teaching. It's, uh, it's a good network of, of musicians there. And this teaching is now is not only, um, um, how do you say, it's increasing now to other kinds of music, uh, music as well. There's Antonio Loretto is a guitar composer. And um, this is a lot of guitars as well now. So Venezuelan music is coming more and more into focus. What I wanted to say is that art musicologists in Venezuela, my colleagues, they're very angry about the system because it's all classical music, classical music, but what's about the drum thing? So um, what is about uh, Llaneros? Uh, what is about uh, uh, Amerindian music? What is about um, um, African music in the north? It's totally ignored. There's no money for that because every, everything goes into the classical music. So um, this is the critics I wanted to, to say. But in general, 80% of the, of the orchestra are from a socioeconomic poor, socioeconomic background. And um, they played this year in Salzburg with 1,400, 1, <laughs> uh, or they're playing Graz now, with uh, uh, 1,400 musicians. So there's a huge orchestra and there's a lot of money in. And I think it's a good idea. Um, but finally, we need to reflect as well the other side of the coin that there are other, uh, other musicians as well, uh, I think needless to say. What? But this kind of system is also sort of social contract, right? To uh, give music education, give opportunities to people with kids from poor backgrounds. And has it been used for other disciplines, other arts? Inside of Venezuela? Yeah, yeah it's, just, uh, it's interesting because Chavez founded in, in 
1998 when he get the power the, the system of uh, Las Fundaciones, the foundation, you know, which was alphabetization, um, water in the barrio. There's a lot of um, other programs, but it's, um, and now we enter into the political thing. Uh, El Sistema was founded before, this is important to say. It's a, it's a project from 1975 by Copé and uh, Adeco, which are completely other parties. They are now in the opposition. And um, sure, Chavez tried to um, incorporate that, that, uh, that uh, orchestra for, for his great work, but it wasn't. But now it is as well. But there are a lot of other programs, um, maybe, who are copying the system of, of, uh, of uh, El Sistema. On the other hand, this is a social public relation to do foundations and to help poor people uh, with a red T-shirt. But what's behind it is another question. So I don't think that there's not this direct uh, uh, copying or orientation. So when you look at, at Eastern German in the, in the German Democratic Republic, I was uh, come from this, and we had a very good musical uh, system as well. We had music schools, and they were paid for, and um, so this is still was existing in social context, or what they call social context, is, is um, still alive, or it's part of public relation. Who that? I know. Ma Maduro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Maduro, but before. Um, but what did you say to yourself? You, you discovered that you came from over this kind of project almost by traveling as yourself. In terms of how to reform it, I was just wondering whether you think that um, this helped Venezuela being totally seen as something that all the communities or freedom of transit has to allow it to be total. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not. Um, I just wanted to show, like, speech codes, logos, well, the old school of Heracles and Heidegger, the both side of the coins. Um, I personally think it's a good thing as public relation from a public relation point of view. Uh, even the jackets are good. It's, oh, it's Venezuela. This is the colors of Venezuela, and it's for for promoting Venezuela as a country uh, for holidays and for, for good music. It's, it's a wonderful uh, public relation tool. It's a marketing tool, obviously. Um, so yes, but uh, um, on the other hand, Dudamel and Abreu always said, we don't want to uh, be incorporated, appropriated uh, to this kind of socialism uh, representing the system as the system of the Venezuelan system. So um, this is maybe different to, well, to, to recognize here. That this, this Dudamel, they are never po politics, they are, they are respect. Uh, Chavez, Chavez dance with the orchestra. I don't have this movie here and whatever, but it's there still. Or it's more more important to say that we are not political in the sense of uh, the fifty percent of socialism in Venezuela, because fifty percent socialist and fifty percent opposition. So uh, the orchestra needs to be uh, between that and get money. This is the problem every every artist has now in Venezuela, even pop music bands. Uh, if you say something against the president, um, you don't will get any money. No more. Uh, gigs will play it, and so we always need to be uh, diploma diplomatic. So, should I just follow up on that one? Because, I mean, a lot of times music is seen, or the arts, as kind of conditioned, right? But then it, it gives room to express against the system, et cetera. Now, I know, again, that we do not, the point is that the orchestra is uh, founded in Puerto Rico, but also as a social enterprise in order to give hope to kids that otherwise would have gone down a similar route. But in, in general, in Venezuela, the arts are then not giving that freedom of expression to what they should be able to give in terms of, you know. Um, I need to be careful. I live there as well. <laughs> So no command, which is a command. Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, at one hand, um, you have um, these wonderful musicians and these wonder wonderful performances. But on the other hand, um, you can quote Heiner Miller here. He always said, I only can do, you know Heiner Miller? He's a 
very famous East German Sjöpa player, Hamlet machine. And um, I had the luck to meet him. He was an uh, alumno, I say alumno. Um, um, he comes from the Bertha Brecht school. Maybe you heard about Bertha Brecht, Hanna Müller, uh, here at Be um, Berlin Ensemble. He was director there. And he said, I cannot uh, do uh, art without a uh, dictator. So I need, I need this pressure to do good art. And maybe if you're a good musician or whatever, uh, you can take this as your image of, of, of your, your self-identity. Uh, or you go with the system and you represent the system, which a lot of mu musicians does. But in classical, um, they have the power that they're very famous right now. So they have the power as well to say, no, we are with the opposition. And inside what I heard about, they, they, they try not to be political, but I have the impression that they are not very convinced of uh, PU as a, what is this called? Um, what a child's party for it. But it's always this interesting uh, point of power and, and art. And there are other arts were completely destroyed. There's a, the, the, uh, when you read about um, Venezuelan um, arts before uh, the, the museo is now a place for homeless people. Okay, homeless people need something to sleep, but there are other options to, to uh, get houses. It don't need to be the National Museum for, um, what is it, uh, uh, the sculptures and paintings. I don't know, I forget the name now. Um, to say this kind of arts. Sorry, was this the National Gallery? What is this? Visuelle uh, Kunst, um, the visual arts. That's what I want to say. Uh, 